Hi, I'm Lydia Lasselar. I'm five-time Winter Olympian in aerial skiing. I'm also a mum and an entrepreneur, and you're listening to The Physical Performance Show. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome back or welcome to another episode of The Physical Performance Show. This is episode 131, proudly brought to you by PhysioCram, Pogo Physio, and a special promotion today from BodyIce.com. I'm Brad Beer, physiotherapist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. The aim of this show is to educate and inspire you towards the pursuit of your own physical best performance. We do this through interviews featuring some of the world's top physical performers and also some of the world's preeminent experts in their chosen field. Each week, we'll aim to bring you the highs, the lows, and the learnings of the featured guests. And boy, oh boy, today's guest... Lydia Lasilla is a five times, that's right, five times winter Olympic representative for Australia. And Lydia clinched the gold medal in 2010 in the Vancouver Winter Olympic Games, where she took gold in the women's freestyle skiing aerials. Four years later, Lydia backed up and took a bronze medal in Sochi once again in the aerials. Lydia's jump in the Sochi Winter Olympics was a quad-twisting triple somersault, a first for a female aerial skier, and it's breaking limits that we focus on in today's conversation. Yes, there's the limits that Lydia courageously broke and overcame in her remarkable sporting career, and there's also the body that broke as well the lows of sport and performance. Lydia takes us through recovery from two ruptured ACLs, one which occurred in training for the 2006 Torino Winter Olympic Games and the second, the re-rupture, which occurred during the Olympic Games when Lydia landed heavily and blew out her knee. Lydia also takes us through the many learnings from her career. And Lydia has a real gift in translating the psychology of sports performance into our everyday lives. You may have seen Lydia on Australian Survivor, Champions vs. Contenders, and seen the sheer determination and competitiveness that Lydia possesses. There's so much in today's conversation. I know you're absolutely going to love it. You may have seen Lydia recently on Australian Survivor, Champions vs. Contenders. You witnessed Lydia's resilience, determination, and capacity firsthand. Here is my conversation with Lydia Lasilla, today's featured performer. Lydia Lasilla, this is something I've been looking forward to for a long time. Just before we started to record, I, I mentioned that I had you identified as someone that had so much to to offer the listenership of this show well before your Australian Survivor fame, but I think your world must look a little bit like pre and post Survivor, is that right? <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's um it's great to be with you today. Look, yeah, life is life is definitely full at the moment. There's lots on the go. I'm a busy mum of two. I run a, a business, Body Ice, and um trying to just do that daily juggle of, of family and business and throwing in a little bit of mentoring in there now, which is which is wonderful. It's it's a way for me to give back. Um and and be a part of other athletes and, and people's journeys as well to their success. So, yeah, lots lots to do at the moment. <laughs> Lydia, you use the word full. 
I suspect that's a very uh, circumspect selection of a word as opposed to busy. <laughs> is that is that a fair uh, assessment? Yeah, they say if you want something done, give it to a busy person. So um, definitely do a lot of things. And um, but I like to, you know, I like to use that word full because it means it's abundant. You know, it means it's I've got a lot of interesting things going on and things that I'm really passionate about and things that I really love. You know, so. Um, full in a good way. <laughs> yeah, no, but words matter, right? So, and I mean, uh, yep. it's uh, it's powerful. Lydia, let's start with the question I like to ask, which is, what's one thing that Lydia Lasilla is learning at the moment? Look, I'm spending a lot of time actually at the moment in one aspect of my business, which is the whole social media content strategy side of things, which is which is not an area that I've particularly paid much attention to before, nor am I very good at, but an area that um, is really important in in business, to my personal brand, and a, and a way for me, obviously, to connect to a larger audience and bring through the values of whether it's my products or my me personally that I can share um, to to the masses. So it is an important part of business these days um, and I don't think I'll ever learn <laughs> everything there is to need to know about it, but I'm trying my hardest at the moment. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you use the word uh, like personal brand. Sh- surely after your overwhelming popularity on Survivor, you know, the awareness of the Australian public uh, must have skyrocketed for for you and the the love and respect and admiration you had through the show. What's been the most surprising thing you've found about your Australian Survivor experience? I think if you can come out of reality TV um, unscathed, (laughs) I think that you're winning, you know. It's it's been really surprising to me um, how much of the kind of the mental focus um, has resonated with with a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I kind of went into that show totally as myself, competing as myself, um, always giving 110% and, and brought some of the skills that I've learned as an athlete to the show and um, things that I kind of have been doing quite routinely for over 15 years um, really stuck out to a lot of people. And so that's been really interesting for me, Um, something that I've been doing mundanely for so long, routinely. It's been part of my preparation day in, day out. Um, A lot of people aren't doing it. (laughs) And a lot of people find it to be um, impressive. So, So I'm really looking forward to sharing a lot of those skills that I've learned over the years, particularly with mental training and, and mental strength and dealing with adversity and building your resilience and building up your focus to be able to kind of focus through any situation is something that um, I'm really passionate about but also that um, I'd like to, to share and I think people need to be able to do. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I guess you feel surprised that something that's so normal – foundational for you and I know at one point you know you use the the phrase that you need to develop great fundamentals and build on your difficulties uh so you see yourself being able to offer a lot to the you know to the world around those fundamentals which to you aren't surprising but to many people are new yeah and and particularly into that mental health and wellness space and and realizing the need obviously we we train our bodies physically and we feed our bodies with really great nutrition but our our brain and our mental state um is really what decides if we have that great performance or if we're you know living with positivity or if we're motivated towards seeing towards achieving our goals so um so i think you know something that I've been doing for many years and my work started with Jeffrey Hodges who's been my my mental training coach and you know I've been building this tool bag full of skills uh, mental training skills and ways to develop myself and um and how to you know how to manage your thoughts and how to um turn those thoughts to always be framed positively and to then how understand how your thoughts affect behaviors and and patterns um and habits you know so um those are skills i've been building for a really long time it's important 
for me now to to share them and and I've just developed a mental training program that we've just launched through Body Ice um, that will kind of kickstart people into doing that. It will break break it all down so that they can develop some skills to be able to manage their thoughts and and um, come through that kind of the adversity that they're facing and just feel or get in touch with that confident future self that they um, they want to be, you know. So it's um, it's really exciting. Um, there's, you know, there's obviously the physical fitness and component that I'm passionate about, but it's also really developing mentally. Um, and in my space where we help people recover from their injuries in terms of body ice, um, it's, it's, I've recognised that people don't not only do they recover physically Mm. but they've got also this emotional and mental hurdle to overcome as well to to reach um, back to peak performance so as a physio you'd understand Mm. that it's yes there's a physical component you've got to do the rehab you've got to build your muscles back but there's this there's this mental and emotional component that also needs to recover so that they can build back towards um you know, their, their normal self or, or an improved self. Yeah, absolutely. I, I say in my day-to-day work, Lydia, that, you know, people can put up with the pain of the injury, but what they really need rehabilitation around is the frustrations, the fears and the anxieties, you know, getting back to their best. And so uh, the, the, the landscape of the, the mental side of rehabilitation and performance is enormous. And it's funny you mentioned Jeffrey Hodges. Uh, I was a junior <laughs> triathlete. That's what I saw would be my life's work, a triathlon career, and it didn't quite mm-hmm. go that way. But I remember reading Sports Mind by Jeffrey Hodges in the late 90s right, or well, mid-90s. Yeah. I've still got it, the blue and red cover. So relevant, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I transformed from an anxious triathlete, mm-hmm. vomiting on the start line, wishing I was somewhere mm-hmm. else to a, through reading that book to a um, an excited, ready to go, I hope my competitor's prepared because I'm ready to go triathlete. And and it was all off the back of starting to work on those sides of things. So um, that was my own transformation. When I saw that, you know, Jeffrey Hodges and yourself had teamed up with the Body Ice Mental Training work, I was very excited. Yeah, look, he's been integral um, to my development and growth over the years, you know, definitely um, was in a phase throughout my earlier parts of my career where I was injured a lot and I'd started to kind of believe that I was always going to be injured um, and that was just bad luck, you know, for me. And he, it wasn't until I started working with him and he's basically blatantly said to me, you've created everything that's happened to you, so if you want to change, we've got to get to work and break down these limiting beliefs that you've got about yourself, like you're always injured or you're, you're number two in the world or all these kind of things. So it was pretty, he was pretty brutal, but it was great for me to hear. <laughs> and, you know, he, he basically in a nutshell got me focusing on the future Lydia that I wanted to be, not the one of the past, and, um, and, and heading towards her rather than dwelling on, on the setbacks that I had. So there's so much more to it. Um, and obviously you picked up a lot of great things in Sports Mind, which, you know, we're, we're also offering those books on our Body Ice site. But Champion mm-hmm. Thoughts, Champion Feelings is a great um, resource as well as his um, mental training program uh, in Sports Hypnosis, which is like a 60-day um, manual. And just going through those processes, I've done them a few times over the years, those programs have, has just, um, every time I do them, there's so much more to learn, you know, about myself and you're in a different phase of life, you're in a different kind of um, mentality as well. So there's, there's, if people can approach mental training, not as something you know you need to you don't need to necessarily fix something but you need to kind of improve you need to make gains you need Mm -hmm. to add to your tool bag just like we do add to our ball skills or or you know your 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 tennis skills or your weight training skills or your crossfit skills you know in a physical sense if they can approach mental training in the same kind of way and say i'm just i've got some pennies in the bank here resources that and skills that I can pull out when I need to you know whether it's in a competition or when I'm under pressure or whether it's before I go into this massive sales meeting or whether it's you know before I go onto the stage to give this public presentation that I'm scared about you know these are all tools and techniques there's so many things that you can kind of equip yourself with that will just help you get through those things so um yeah it's really an area that is just 
overlooked or underlooked um, <laughs> and mm. such an area that I think is so important. And, you know, I like what you mentioned there, Lydia. It doesn't have to – it's not actually abstract and ethereal, like way out there. It's, it can be very mm. practical and you use the words tools in your tool bag. And so uh, mm. we'll tag links up to some of those great resources there in the show notes um, and, I, and I must encourage anyone to – to get out and, and have a look and, and look at, the, at these resources, whether you're looking to win Olympic gold like uh, Lydia Lasilla or, you know, be <laughs> your best in your local park run or whatever it may be, but it's it's those skills. And you use the word, I think, something similar, Lydia, that, you know, they transfer into other life's adversities, right? When you're up the, the pole, oh, when you're up the top of the pole in Survivor and we're watching my family and we're like, she's not going to quit. Um, you know, <laughs> Never. You, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately for me, that was probably my weak point, my downfall. <laughs> oh, Lydia. Hey, you used two, two phrases there that I thought were, were brilliant, and it will give a bit of context to, Lydia, your your journey. And, and it's, a, it's a long one. It spans five Olympic campaigns uh, plus the, print, you know, the, the developmental years, and, and time doesn't allow for us to go into huge detail there, but you used the words, the delineation that you started to – to to put there with Jeffrey, and that is the future Lydia that you wanted to be and not the one in the past. Can we just spend a little bit of time, Lydia, giving listeners context to your journey, your background, you were a gymnast, uh, and then you found your way onto the slopes the first time on the, on the, on the the ice and then jumps eventually and, you know, and on we went. So can you give a little bit of history uh, for our benefit? Yeah, I, um, I did start off as a gymnast and I thought I was going to the Olympics as an Olympic gymnast thought I was going to be the next Nadia Comaneci but a long story short that it, it didn't work out for me and I and I retired at, at 17 and about the same time um, the Olympic Windy Institute were looking for ex-gymnasts um, to trial and turn into aerial skiers so it was a bit of a pilot program it was definitely um, they were looking for guinea pigs and I get the call and um, they've said Lydia you know would you like to try um and convert these acrobatic skills that you've been learning in gymnastics to to become an aerial skier. And um, I didn't know anything about the sport. I hadn't skied before. I um, thought that the sport looked really appealing to me. It looked very exciting. It it was amazing and spectacularly acrobatic. And um, and I guess the the big draw card for me was the chance of going to the Olympics and this time the the Winter Olympics. And that was something that... I'd fell, fell in love with the Olympic movement. It kind of was something that I always felt was my purpose. My purpose was to be an athlete, but I was going to be an Olympic champion and I just had to find a sport. <laughs> um, and so that, so it couldn't have been better timing, really, that, that um, this sport was presented to me and I kind of dove straight into it, threw myself into it. As a younger athlete, I was very um, reckless in a, in a sense. Um, I, I believed, uh, and this is one of my limiting beliefs, I guess, that, that if you worked hard, you'd be successful and, and possibly came, you know, from my dad who, who is a complete workhorse worked to, you know, so hard throughout his, um, industry. And, um, and in many ways, I, I that was ingrained in me. And, and what it actually did was I burnt out. I got injured. I jumped through pain. I jumped through injury. Um, I pushed when I should have been listening to my body and pulled back. And unfortunately, just with this, you know, being in a pilot program and a bit of a guinea pig, there wasn't really anyone around to kind of rein me in and say, okay, we might need to pace out a little bit here. I was doing triple the amount of jumping anyone else was doing in the world. And I was going for it. And I, I was desperate to be good. I just wanted to be the best. And that was a good thing I had. I had vision. I I knew what I wanted. I wanted to jump like the men, you know, be that first woman to to jump like the men and do these incredible triple somersaults with multiple twists. and, And I wanted to break boundaries. And I think that was good, but I just didn't have a plan to get there. I didn't have the strategy. I didn't understand delayed gratification. I wanted it all at once. And I ended up going to my first Olympics in 2002, which was 18 months after clicking skis on for the first time. Wow. So that was my first year competing ever, and I was at the Olympics. And I finished eighth. (laughs) So I made the finals and finished eighth. Mind you, I had shoulder reconstruction afterwards. I had a torn medial ligament in my knee. I had a cyst growing in in my spine that was causing numbness down my right leg. I was a complete mess 
physically, physically beaten up because I threw my body around and didn't understand that that I needed to look after my body for it to look after me and have longevity in the sport. So I kind of went from this really desperate um, wanting to win, wanting to be successful athlete um, through a series of injuries up and down. I was ranked number two the next year after that, so I was achieving success. I was good. I was winning World Cups, but I was always injured. And I guess the, um, the deciding moment was when I – ruptured my ACL in the Torino 2006 Olympics in the semifinals. And that was the second time I'd ruptured it in a matter of six months. And um, pretty bad timing at the Olympic Games. Um, The worst timing ever. I thought I was going to win those Olympics. (laughs) So you can understand, very disappointing. Um, I was shattered. I'd never, you know, you don't know as an athlete, particularly in a sport like mine, which, which is high risk, high impact, you, you don't know if you're going to get another chance, you know, at an Olympic Games. And um, from that moment, I didn't want to go through any more injury or setback because I knew I was good, but I needed help, you know, in terms of how am I going to get there? I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I didn't understand, you know, that I was just pushing too hard um, at times when, you know, I should have just... Um, been pulling back a little bit, been pacing myself and understanding, just being a lot smarter. So I shifted that work hard mentality um, by, you know, I started working with Jeffrey Hodges, who clearly pointed out everything that I was doing wrong. (laughs) Um, And we started, you know, breaking down these limiting beliefs. And one of them was this, you know, work hard to be successful, work hard to be successful. Well, in part, yeah. But I also had to work a lot smarter, not harder. And that's what really switched for me. It really changed. I started breaking down my limiting beliefs. I started working throughout that, you know, period of three surgeries and ACL reconstructions and the year off of rehab, I, um, I worked on my mental game. I broke everything down so that I could understand that every thought that I had had an effect on my behaviour. And... Those behaviours over time cause patterns and habits and I was break. I, I needed to break some of those habits and patterns, which I did. And, and so, Lydia, that was a real, obviously, shift for you at the fundamental level of, of your, your psyche. You use the word, you had a desperation, you use the phrase, sorry, Lydia, you had the, the desperation to be good. Mm-hmm. Where did that desperation come from? Yeah, um... It's a difficult one to answer, that desire to to want to be good, um, to want to be the best at something. I don't know where that comes from. I have always remembered having it. <laughs> and it probably came, you know, from growing up with three older brothers that often told me that I couldn't keep up or I, and I often lost everything, you know, whether it was table tennis or, or soccer or kicking the footy. I was... As a, you know, a little girl, I couldn't keep up with them and I was always trying to prove myself that, that I could do the same things as them. So perhaps it came from them, but I'd certainly had a very, um, I had an intensity about me as a kid. Um, my mum often, my mum often says, you know, I was in, you know, calisthenics class as a three-year-old and all the other kids would be running off to their mums and not being able to kind of stay in one spot. And I was at the front glued to the instructor, you know, mirroring her every move. And she kind of knew from there, she's like, okay, this, <laughs> it's not quite normal. She's got an extreme focus. And um, <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, it's something that I've always had. And it's interesting because one of my idols in Nadia Comaneci um, I remember it was in a documentary that I kind of recently saw where she said that she could she could do high volumes and huge repetitions without boredom affecting her focus and that resonated with me. I was like, "Yes, that's me. I could go for hours like a diesel engine and my from my first la- jump to my last jump, my last jump could of 60 in a day could be the best jump of the day. Do you know what I mean? So I, I, I could repeat and I could do a huge volumes without boredom affecting my focus. So it meant I just could go 
for a long time. And I don't know where that's from because that's something I've always had. <laughs> and, and obviously when you're standing at the top of an Olympic you know, campaign and you're on your 13th jump of a six hour final, you know, which was, which was one of your, I think it was Vancouver, maybe it was uh, Sochi, which was, oh, that was Sochi. Sochi. Yeah. Sochi was brutal, brutal format. Yeah. You know, that, that trait is a great aid to your performance. What, 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 let me ask you this then, what drives you and what drove you to work so hard? I think if something's important enough. So I think if, if your vision for yourself or your goal or, or your business or, your family life or whatever, I think it doesn't really matter what it's for. But if that vision of yourself is really clear and compelling, like when you close your eyes, you can see yourself on the top of the dice with that Olympic gold medal around your neck. You can feel the emotions that you're going to be feeling at that point in time. Um, You really can see yourself in that moment, but also feel what it's going to be like to be in that moment. And if that's compelling enough for you, you'll find a way to make it happen. And that's, for me, um, I've always been able to generate an emotional connection to to that Lydia kind of that I wanted to be. And that is so powerful um, and that's what keeps me going because I want to get there. I want to achieve that. I want to feel what that would feel like. And, and in 2010, the Vancouver Olympics, you've come back from two successive knee major injuries the acl injuries you've transformed Mm. your your way of thinking your approach to sport and life Mm. uh you're at the top of the run you know you know about to hit a a, a steep ramp at 60 plus k an hour (laughs) um to to try and become the lydia that you had envisioned uh what's going through your head as you know that what's about to take place in the next i don't know 15 seconds probably not even that could determine whether that yeah, happens three, or not. Like three. three, yeah, that's an over exaggeration. Um, it probably feels like fifteen minutes. So, what, how, yeah. how do you practically put put us in the space of your thoughts and some of these tools in your tool bag? How on earth do you get that job done and execute that when it matters most? Yeah, and especially in those high pressure moments, um, you really have to be disciplined with your thoughts and not thinking too far ahead, um, but also not dwelling on you know what's happened five minutes ago. You have to be present and learn how to be present and we can practice that in, in everyday life, whether you're sitting in traffic and you find yourself getting frustrated, you know, you can kind of just decide at that point in time, you know what, I'm sitting here, this is the reality of my situation, but getting frustrated is not going to help me, I'm going to crank the music up and I'm going to have a sing-along <laughs> because that's going to make me feel better, you know, so... We have all these choices in how we perceive situations and how we turn them around to make them work for us. At the Olympics, I'd transformed as an athlete prior to that. I dominated into the lead-up. I almost felt like I couldn't put a foot wrong. I felt like I was being drawn to the, this my future self. So this future self concept is a really powerful um, tool. I felt like, you know, you've got that elastic band kind of pulling you towards that person that's definitely the feeling that I was having I was becoming her um I remember in between jumps you know I'd be riding the lift and you know I'd have a thought come up and um it would you know for example if you land this next jump you're going to win and whilst that's a positive thought it I had to kind of be really disciplined and go snap out of it slap myself and go whoa 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 just stay where you are. Where are you, Lid? Remind myself. Where are you? Oh, I'm just here. I'm just riding up the lift about to do my next jump. Well, what are you going to focus on? Well, I'm going to focus on you have these internal conversations. You go crazy, but you have to stay present. And I'm going to focus on this next jump, which is I'm going to hit my takeoff position on the jump and let the rest sort, sort itself out. The rest is autopilot. Keep your eyes on the landing and you're going to nail it. You know, so you have to be disciplined. And I was that night and had been in, you know, a lot of different situations. And then I'd get up to the top and my name was announced and the, the, the roar of the crowd was huge. And I remember thinking, whoa, that was loud. <laughs> and, you know, and that's just a thought, you know. And it's kind of like what do you let affect you and what do you kind of let bounce off? Like, a, like water off a duck's back. Like you just kind of shake it off, you know. And so at that point I'm like, okay. It was loud, but it's not going to affect me right now. Because why? Because I'm going to think about my takeoff because that's what's going to win me this gold medal. Do you know what I mean? So 
It's constant discipline, managing your thoughts, thinking about what you want to happen rather than what you don't want to happen, filtering out useful information and tossing aside really useless information. You know, it could be something someone says to you. Do you just you, do you take it in or do you bounce it off, kind of like this reflective shield? So there's all these image, these you know, there's imagery that you can use, like the reflective shield, bouncing that thought off, or the water off a duck's back, or floating on, you know, um, being kind of on a bridge and watching the thoughts kind of flow by, uh, water water flowing by. Like there's there's so many different techniques that you can use, and I learnt them by that stage. So that night, you know, I was really calm really, um, you know, at peace, a couple of cues in my head in terms of, yep, hit your takeoff, eyes on the landing hill, and that's it, <laughs> mm. you know, keeping it really simple and fighting hard to stay in that present moment, staying where I was. That's the hardest part. And it's so interesting, Lydia, uh, you know, just this weekend gone, I spent some time with some triathletes competing in the World Triathlon Series here and I asked the bronze medalist from uh, the Rio Games, you know, how did you approach your Olympic campaign? And he said, people do funny things come the Olympics. It's just another race, mm. but they let the emotion mm-hmm. of it take over. He said, I approached it like like a local race and, you know, you had success. Yep. So, And I think the thing I get fascinated on this here, Lydia, with is you've just described it so matter-of-factly, you know, this is what I did and, you know, there's a lot more to it. But to be an Olympic champion, clearly you have to think differently. <laughs> You know, you can't think like everyone else, right? So how could you extrapolate your thinking to become an Olympic gold medalist for the the listener of the show who's wanting to pursue their best physically or in life? You know, what would be one key point you'd take away from how you manage success in, in the 2010 Vancouver Winter Olympic Games? I think um, this whole notion of, of if a goal is important to you, if it really is meaningful and, and you are compelled, you you want it really badly, then you'll find a, your own way to make it happen, you know, and this is kind of my way. This is what I had to do um, in terms of really getting on top of my mental game and and um, overcoming my fears of re-injury. You know, four years before the Vancouver Olympics, there was a lot going on. You know, I blew my knee at the Olympics Media brought that up before the Vancouver Olympics constantly. Aren't you afraid you're going to hurt your knee again? You know, it kept on popping up. So I had to develop some really thick skin. So everyone's journey is different. Everyone's needs are different. But if the goal is compelling and if you can see yourself clearly clearly achieving it, if you want it enough, you'll find your own way to make that happen and and whether you take, you know, a snippet from today's talk as a skill that you've learnt that you might apply or, you know, whatever the case. Um, yeah, I think it, it, you just your goal has to be compelling. You're listening to Lydia Lasilla, 2010 Winter Olympic Champion in the aerial skiing and five times Australian Winter Olympic representative sharing around her highs, lows and learnings of her remarkable sporting career. Support for today's show comes from Physiocrem. Physiocrem is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients. It's ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that Physiocrem does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates. It is clean to use and pleasant smelling, with the smell fading away in just minutes. Its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. Physiocrem can be found at chemists and health stores Australia-wide, as well as via the online shop. Physiocrem are generously offering a 20% discount to listeners of the Physical Performance Show by using the coupon code POGO, that's P-O-G-O, over at the shop, which is physiocrem, F-I-S-I-O-C-R-E-M dot com dot A-U. Herding sucks and Physiocrem have your back. Today's episode is also proudly brought to you by POGO Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to complete your rehabilitation, 
get back to your physical best and cross your physio finish line. In addition to traditional session-to-session pay-as-you-go appointments, we offer some industry-first models of care, including our very popular monthly fixed-fee wellness booster packs designed to help you save money and recover faster. The wellness boosters include remedial massage, physiotherapy, clinical pilates, active rehabilitation such as exercise physiology, and use of -of state-of-the-art equipment such as the Alter-G anti-gravity treadmill, all starting from a low $195 health fund rebatable per month. To find out more about Pogo Physio and our unique services, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now, let's jump back with today's featured guest, five times Australian Winter Olympian, Lydia Lucilla. Lydia, the Sochi campaign, and I want to then throw over to some career learnings, highs, lows, and learnings. You know, from my understanding, if, if you had have been satisfied or content to do a routine type, you know, uh, jump, you likely would have been a, a dual Olympic champion 2010, 2014. But, you know, you used the phrase before, you were always trying to prove yourself to your older brothers. And as soon as you said that, it actually made sense why then you were trying to yeah. prove something to the sport of aerial jumping that the women could be on parity with the men. The men. Can you put listeners in context with what you were trying to achieve in the Sochi campaign and then the outcomes? Yeah, so um, when I started the sport, um, you know, one of my goals obviously was to win an Olympic gold medal. But another one of my goals, which was equally compelling, was to jump like the men and do tri- quad tw- a quad, be the first woman to do a quad twisting triple somersault, which was a skill that no woman had done before. And when I first started the sport, the execution um, between there was a big gap between what women were doing and what men were doing. And um, I wanted to make it kind of my mission to close that gap. And so that is the journey that I set out on, not because I needed to, to in order to win, but I wanted to prove it was possible and I wanted to I wanted to see how far I could go. And if that meant, you know, doing a quad-twisting triple somersault, then that's what I was kind of shooting for. Um, so after Vancouver... I was already doing, I won those Olympics doing really high quality triple somersaults, one twist off what the men were doing at that point in time. And um, I had some time off after that. I became a mum. And yes, it, I wanted straight away, I knew that I wanted to come back to the sport as a mother. I wanted to prove that that was possible because <laughs> it hadn't quite been done at that point. And I wanted to also um fulfill another milestone that I'd set for myself a long time ago which was to be the first woman to do the quad twisting triple somersault yet I also wanted to be a a dual uh, Olympic champion you know that was also a goal as well but as I found out towards the Sochi Olympics um the goal of breaking boundaries and doing this trick became more important than being a dual Olympic champion and so crunch time on the final jump in the you know the sixth hour of competition 13th triple for the day I had a decision to make you know do you back down secure the win and do something you know you're going to nail or do you go for it go for broke and do the quad twisting triple somersault which will be your third ever attempt take a huge risk and, and do it and um at that point in time and it is the same now I wouldn't do anything differently that point in time doing that trick was more important to me than winning another olympic gold medal and that's the decision i made and i'm glad i did because i would have regretted it if i didn't do it because at that moment it wasn't your drive wasn't another gold it was important to you but your drive was to prove to yourself what's possible you'd spent your mm-hmm. childhood proving to your brothers that you know you were a worthy <laughs> younger sister so that thread just ran strong and what, I, really love is, what I love is that you don't regret it even now. Um, no, not at all. Not one bit. No, because, you know, I, I think it's important to leave a legacy um, in, in sport and, and I certainly did that night and, and set the tone for, for a new set of standards, you know, raised the bar, broke through a bit of a glass ceiling and, um, 
I think that's important for the next generation to see. You know, you've said, Lydia, that the best thing about being an Olympic gold medalist, so obviously the, the dual Olympic gold medalist, uh, you know, outcome wasn't there with going for the, uh, I can't even say it, you know, let alone even think about how to do it, the quadruple <laughs> twisting, triple somersault. Triple uh, somersault, yeah. yeah. <laughs> was that, you know, it, it meant that you'd perform when it matters. What's important to you about performing when it matters? Um. You know, performing when it matters is, it's, it's, um, you know, you're in a high, at the Olympics, you're in a high pressure situation. And I don't think anyone, I mean, there's a lot of expectation set by other people, but there's also that level of expectation that you set for yourself. And um, being able to perform under pressure uh, when it matters is, is a skill. Um, Some people, only get to maybe achieve it once. Other people, like a Roger Federer, like a Serena, you know, think of those people that do it over and over and over again. And because they've been in that situation many, many times, they know how to do it and they can repeat it. So you have your kind of your one-shot wonders, but then you have your repeat kind of offenders that (laughs) keep succeeding and are able to perform under pressure over and over again and it's a it's a learned I think it's a learned skill so it comes to some people more naturally um but others can really be able to set aside fear set aside expectations set aside everything bring it down to basics stay in that present moment and focus on the technical aspects of executing the trick or the skill or whatever it is and then kind of keeping that compartmentalised, keeping the emotion away but focusing on the technique. That's how I kind of have managed it in the past. Just if I think about the technique and how I want to do this next jump or um, whatever it is, then that's that's my best shot at, at doing that, you know, focusing on what you want to happen, not what you don't want to happen. Yeah, no, that's so performing, you know, uh, performing when it matters is a validation tool in many ways but it's also making sure that uh, you seize the opportunity because the opposite really isn't very uh very satisfying right (laughs) no no and you know i've had many situations where i haven't i've underperformed you know and um whether it's i've let pressure get to me or whether i my mind is kind of just wasn't there that day you know it's drifted it's lost its focus its concentration or i've thought about the jump before or the jump, you know, two jumps from now or gone gone a bit too far ahead. And you, you, if you've got enough awareness about yourself, you can pick up where you made those errors and correct it the next time. Brilliant. Lydia, um, let's throw over to some career learning. So highs, lows and learnings. Uh, I've got to ask, though, because I'd make an assumption otherwise, what would you rate as your career high athletically and then your career low or the darkest day in your athletic journey? What are those two sides of the equation for Lydia Lasilla? I think that period of, you know, being really injured was definitely my low, being this up and down cycle of injury, um, knowing that I could be better, but having this kind of excuse as physical injury um, being there. And that was really frustrating period for me, knowing that I could be better, but I was always injured. Um, that was definitely the low. That was kind of 2000, well, pretty much from the minute I started to about 2007, I would say. So a long time to be in pain um, and um, dealing with that frustration. The high would have certainly been overcoming that and winning in 2010. I think that was certainly a high. Um, breaking that boundary in 2014 and doing the quad twisting triple, that was that was certainly a high because um, I proved it was possible, but I also proved it was possible for a mum. Hmm. So that was important to me. Um, yeah, those probably are the two key highs and lows. Yeah, no, brilliant. You, you mentioned there, Lydia, before we throw it all performance around, you know, the importance of, you know, showing mums what, what's possible. And you've got your two beautiful sons, Kai and Alex. Uh, Alec, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, Lydia. And right. I, I read in preparing for today that in the Australian that uh, Kai, your son, I think he might have been watching your, your fifth Olympic Games campaign in South Korea and 
Uh, this is what the Australian journalist wrote to her eldest son, Kai, six at the time, I believe that was this year, who has travelled to the last few World Cups in preparation for the Olympics and who hates seeing mummy crash. Uh, <laughs> Lucilla said directly, I am so sorry, Kai. What was the story around around that? Um, Kai, you know, he uh, he's fortunate enough and I was fortunate enough to bring him along for the journey, um, you know, um, leading into the Sochi Olympics, he was there, um, or well, not there in person, but m- watched Mummy on TV and got to see Mummy jumping. You know, not just doing a day job and running a business and and being mum, but got to see me in that in that role, in that light, in in as the aerial skier, which um, which was great for him to share and and um, great for me to share with him. And I guess yeah, in my final fifth Olympic campaign, I had one of those moments. You know. Under, completely underperformed. Um, I didn't crash a jump all practice all week leading into those Olympics and then the, the two that I did managed to be in the competition. So huge disappointment um, and complete kind of, yeah, under un, underperformance and concentration just kind of wasn't there that day, which is <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and, yeah, and so I kind of went over to Kai and, um, yeah, he doesn't like seeing anybody crash because you see a lot of crashes in aerial skiing. People don't understand that you don't land everything Um, and they're spectacular crashes at that. But, um, yeah, him seeing me not kind of ski away from those jumps, you know, I felt like I'd let him down a little bit. Um, And so I probably, yeah, used that as an opportunity to say sorry. (laughs) And what was little Kai's response, Lydia? He doesn't care. <laughs> he's just like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, Mum, you know. And that's the thing, like, it doesn't, you know, it's important to, I think it was, it's been important for me, for Kai to see me fail and succeed and realise that, that it's a learning experience and that, that that's part of life, you know. It is. We don't always win. And um, for me to be able to show him that in its brutal form and its reality is, I think, really important. Um, and, and it doesn't affect anything between us as long as we've got kind of that family connection and balance and love. He doesn't care whether I've got 10 gold medals or, or none, you know. You're still mummy. It's a little Kai. Still mum. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You're listening to 2010 Winter Olympic Champion Lydia Lasilla for the women's aerial skiing, sharing around the highs, the lows, and the learnings of her remarkable career to date. If you missed last week's episode featuring Tim Don, three times British Olympic triathlon representative and world Ironman triathlon record holder, sharing around his remarkable comeback from a C2 neck fracture, a hangman's fracture, to return to the scene of the accident one year later in the 2018 Hawaii Ironman World Triathlon Championships, then it is a must listen. To tune into the full episode featuring Tim Don, episode 130 of the Physical Performance Show, be sure to jump over to your favorite podcast player, download the entire episode, and while you're there, peruse the archives. For now, let's jump back with Lydia Lasilla sharing around the highs, the lows, and the learnings of her career. Lydia, let's talk about the learnings and the performance round. Are you ready? Sure. Far away. Lydia Lasilla, dual Olympic winter medalist and gold medalist from 2010. What's the training session you most disliked and then the training session you most loved? I dislike any kind of endurance sessions because I, I just don't like going for a long amount of time or going really, really hard in endurance. Um, but I make myself do it. Um, and I love the, the, the skill sessions, just the, the jumping of being an aerial skier, something skillful, whether it's on the trampoline or on the ramps or, or just the doing of that sport. Um, that's what brings me the most joy. (laughs) What was your pre-competition meal, your favorite pre-competition meal? Favorite pre-comp meal is, um, Probably Vegemite toast. <laughs> as a, as <laughs> something a light. Good Australian would say. <laughs> yeah, I don't get so hungry. Something something fairly light and, um, yeah, something that just kind of, yeah, 
when you're away for so long, I tend to tend to eat a lot of Vegemite toast on the road. Hi, uh, miss a veggie. Who's the athlete that you most admire and why? I, I think I'd, I'd have to say Roger Federer just because of his longevity and his passion for the sport. You know, he's so passionate about it. He loves what he does, obviously. obviously. Um, and to have that type of longevity in sport um, just is a testament to how sh- mentally strong he is, not just his physical but how mentally strong that guy is to be able to perform over and over and over so many for so many years now. Yeah, outstanding. Uh, I suspect the answer to this is yes, but is that, was there a mantra that you would use regularly when you were competing? Self-talk. Yeah. Um, and it and it shifted. It did change. It changed from hard work makes easy, like hard work <laughs> which, makes is a, which is which is a Nadia kind of <laughs> um, Nadia uh, quote, um, to reminding myself to every day to just be smart, be smart with my body, Lydia. Be smart, be smart today. Don't make any silly decisions, um, so that I could just stay on track. Yeah, great. So it shifted to to be smart. Your best recovery tip. I suspect that uh, icing is going to rate a a key mention, not because you're a Winter Olympian and not because you're the founder (laughs) of some brilliant icing products, but what is your best recovery tip from hard training sessions? Lydia? I do love an ice bath. I'll definitely um, fill the fill the bathtub wherever I am with some snow or, or ice and have a good soak, um, especially after, after a hard day of jumping or just a legs day and just to get them just to get all the toxins out. Um, but yeah, definitely had to ice a lot, um, particularly my knee that would get quite kind of swollen um when i was jumping so good ice pack is certainly handy which is the inspiration behind my whole product range anyway <laughs> the world needs good ice uh, ice uh, packs Lydia, <laughs> and body ice does tick that box and i'm not just saying that mm. i uh you know icing needs to be practical and and uh easy to do and that, that, that it's covered That's by right. body ice lydia how would you describe being in the zone um it's a quiet place where there's not much internal chatter going on um, and you're thinking very practically and simply um, about your, your certain technique or what your next move is. Feel very calm. When were you last in that zone? Hmm. Probably in Survivor, I would say. I used that, that, those techniques, you know, whether it was holding up a heavy bag that was getting quite painful or standing on a pole that was really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, I have a tendency to be able to go to go to a different place you know and transport myself out of that uncomfortable scenario yeah hence hence uh why your competitors on the on the show uh felt they needed to eliminate you one (laughs) one word to describe your competition style what would that one word be aggressive (laughs) um yeah always wanted to always wanted to win and um that desire to win but um not not hold anything back nice lydia you're out of the performance round well done you can chalk that up as a training <laughs> session for the day Phew. lydia across your five olympic campaigns your work around the psychology of performance uh you know there's so much to you and your story and you're still writing new chapters but if you could boil all your learnings down to one solitary piece of advice for listeners of this program wanting to pursue their best in life or physically what would Lydia Lasilla's one piece of advice be? I know it's a difficult question. Um, I think whatever your profession is, you need to find balance in life. Um, I think, you know, earlier on in my career, I was too kind of single-minded towards being just the athlete. Um, and I became a much better competitor and athlete when I had perspective and balance in life, whether that's through creating another business, so something else to focus on or, or an extra, extra study, um, having a family um, and having other interests outside my sport. And that gave me balance, gave me perspective, and it made me more wholesome. So fine balance. Mm. Powerful. Lydia, fun question to get to know the personality <laughs> behind the guest. Uh, three people at a dinner table, living or past, who's at your dinner table and why? Oh, Tony Robbins, his energy is just um, incredible and, you know, he's one of the best of the best in, in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, and just, yeah, would love to have that one-on-one time with him. I'd love to 
sit with Roger Federer. I'd love to know how he ticks and what keeps him motivated um, after so many years and how he transformed, I suppose, as an athlete because apparently he was pretty snotty as a, as a youngster and, and changed his attitude. Um, so I find that really interesting. Third person would be probably someone the greatest of the past and I'd say that would be Bruce Lee, the philosopher, the athlete. What an interesting guy, you know. He... Just some of the some of his quotes and some of his movies and his mind was incredible, um, and his body, you know, was incredible. But he's this, he's this just this deep thinker. Um, it would be a very deep dinner conversation. Hey, I've got to ask. I'd have to throw in a couple of bottles of wine. <laughs> to <watch my> food. <laughs> I, I want to come to that table too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wouldn't it be awesome? Oh my oh, god, it'd be amazing. Hey, Lydia, finally finish these sentences if you, if, if if you may. The most important thing in life is? Balance. Is there a word that guides your life? Passion. Where does pressure come from? Within. (laughs) Are you more externally driven or internally driven? Internally. And what mistakes are you afraid of making? Um, What mistakes am I afraid of making? I'm not. (laughs) I'm not afraid of making mistakes. Um, the worst mistake is not learning from a mistake. Lydia, with that, thank you for <laughs> your time today. That is so powerful. And, you know, uh, listeners, you're going to want to check out some of Lydia's projects, The Will to Fly, the movie. Uh, I've watched the shorts and I want to sit down with my family and watch the full feature-length movie, but that's available and you can just Google that. We'll tag it up in the show notes. But Lydia... For people that want to follow your journey, uh, where can they find you? What's the best way to arm themselves with, with some more Lydia Lucilla? I'm probably sharing more of myself on, on Instagram, so at, at Lydia Lucilla, and, you know, that's connected to my Facebook page as well. Um, so that's probably where, yeah, I'm going to be sharing a lot more of whether it's mental training techniques, some of the, my fitness tips and recovery tips, um, my family life, um, my hobbies, my passions. Yeah, so I think that's probably the best place to find me. Easy, and you're certainly easy to find. And finally, Lydia, the physical performance show, every guest issues a physical challenge for the week. So what is <laughs> Lydia Lasilla's challenge to the listeners of the show going to be? Oof. I reckon it will just be something very simple that everyone can do and it will be a two minute two minutes of wall sit. So basically in a 90 degree angle against the wall, um, sitting there, you can break up the two minutes in, you know, whether it's 30 seconds, but make up two minutes every day, every week, and you're going to get some nice quad ha- action going. Fantastic. And if you do take that on, do let Lydia know with some social proof over on social media and tag Lydia in. I might have to join in. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lydia, thank you for your time and, uh, and all the best with everything that you, you set your mind and energies to in the future. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show. And I trust, in fact, I know that you enjoyed today's episode featuring Lydia Lasilla. So much in that episode with Lydia's sharings. Now, if you did enjoy it, then be sure to let Lydia and myself know. You can drop a message over on social media. Lydia is very easy to follow. Her Instagram handle is Lydia Lasilla, L-Y-D-I-A-L-A-S-S-I-L-A. So search for Lydia, you'll find her easily. I'm at Brad underscore beer and the Physical Performance Show's handle is at Physical Performance Show. Now, Lydia has very generously opened up a 20% off the entire body ice range for listeners of the Physical Performance Show. You heard Lydia mention body ice as a product that she developed in desperation for a good icing product and solution for her sporting injuries, such as her twice blown out ACL for her knees. If you jump over to bodyice.com, there you'll see the great body ice range of products all designed to help you recover better. There's the sporting performance range, products for women's specific needs, and some great fun icing and heat pack solutions for kids' knocks and bruises. You'll also see over at Body Ice the mental training 
program which Lydia referenced through today's conversation. And the best part is Lydia has generously opened up a 20% off code, which is Recover Better for any of the products which you'll find over at bodyice.com. So do go and check those products out. I can vouch that they are absolutely terrific. A big thanks to the good folk who have been leaving reviews over on iTunes for the Physical Performance Show. A massive thank you this week to Sar JC. Sar JC commented, favorite sports podcast, five stars. This is by far my favorite podcast to listen to. As an Australian athletics fan, it is hard to get much of an insight into the lives of some of our best athletes. Whilst not an Australian, my favorite interview so far is the one with Bernard Legat. What a star. Sar, thank you for taking the time to leave a rating and review. We really appreciate it. If you drop me a message at Brad underscore beer over on social media or my email b.beer at pogophysio.com.au, I'll send you out a signed copy of the second revised and expanded edition of You Can Run Pain-Free as a little thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Don't forget to hit subscribe from within your favorite podcast player to subscribe to the episodes as they go live each and every week. A big thanks to the good folk who make the Physical Performance Show possible. That's Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin on all things show administration, and Matthew Olding on all things graphic design. Of course, another big thank you to show supporter PhysioCrem. Don't forget to jump over to the store and use the POGO code physiocrem.com.au to receive 20% off the entire range of PhysioCrem products. And once again, don't forget to check out the great range of products on offer at bodyice.com. Keep the podsies coming. That's the screenshot of the episode you're listening to. Tagging in at Brad underscore beer or at physical performance show. They're a whole lot of fun. I love to see where you're listening to the show from and which episode you're enjoying. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the physical performance show, we shift gears and we throw over to an expert edition. And I had the pleasure of sitting down once again with return guest of the physical performance show. Dr. Richard Willey. Rich Willey is a running physiotherapist, a running-based researcher from the University of Missoula. And Richard last appeared on the Physical Performance Show on episode 74. Now, this expert edition is purely to focus on the master runner. What's a master runner? That's anyone really from the age of 40 onwards. You can pick your threshold and make it wherever you like. But this is all about helping people run across their lifespan and realize the benefits of staying active with the beautiful and wonderful activity that is running. As you know, it's very near and dear to my heart. So be sure to tune in next week to the Physical Performance Show where we throw to an expert edition with return guest, Dr. Rich Willey. Until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer and this has been the Physical Performance Show. Hold up. 